Hey, my name's Brendan. Welcome to Highlands Online. If you're a regular here, or if this is your first time, you're so welcome, and we're glad you're with us. We'd love to hear from you on our Facebook or Instagram or our website. If you've got questions or prayer requests, or if you just want to say hey, we'd love to hear from you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. I found in life that life happens. That's deep, isn't it? Life happens. There are days when you're on a mountaintop and you're having a mountaintop experience and you're going, this is fantastic. How good is this? And the next, sec- next second, you seem to be in a valley going, what happened? How did I end up here? And I think that's what life happens like that. Can you remember days like that? You remember days where you've been on that mountaintop and everything's great and all of a sudden the telephone call comes in and you're in the valley. Well, you're feeling great and you go to the doctor and they say, oh, no, no, it's not great. And I think life happens and it's how we deal with life is so, so important. Life happened to Jesus. I think in Luke chapter 3, it says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. While he prayed, the heaven was opened. The Holy Spirit descended bodily in the form of a dove upon him. A voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son. I'm well pleased. What a mountaintop experience. The heavens opened. The, the, the God himself saying, hey, what a, you're my beloved son. And then the next breath, in Luke chapter 4, it says, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, rather than rather Luke chapter 3, when the, all the people were baptised. No, I missed a verse. There you go. Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards when it ended, he was hungry. Mountaintop experience to hungry. And I think, wow, you know, isn't that life? Isn't that life that we, we go through experiences where we, we're encountering God, we're having a great life, we're doing amazing things and all of a sudden the world changes on us. And Jesus experienced that. Let me just say this. Suffering sucks. That's quotable. Suffering sucks. But make use of suffering, don't just suffer. Make use of the suffering. I was talking to Doug Wood just before as we were getting a coffee and he was telling me a story. He said, you know, because we're having a bit of joke and he said, you know, I said, how are you? He said, you know, we're good. And he said, it's not much use being bad, no much use complaining, no one listens. And he said, you know, there was a lady in my brother's work and she was called misery. (laughs) Because everything she saw wasn't good enough. It was just misery. She was nicknamed misery. Look, suffering sucks, but make use of the suffering. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 15, it says this, And Jesus made you for the suffering. He returned in the power of the Spirit, and news went out through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified from, by all. He made use of the suffering. He didn't just go out into the wilderness and was hungry. He actually overcame the temptation and the challenges of the devil himself and came back in the power of the Spirit. If something happens when we face suffering face on and make use of it because we have a power over the thing that caused us to have suffering. There's a saying, never waste a good crisis. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking about the Great Depression. Moira and I are listening to a book at the moment and I had this section on the Great Depression and I thought, wow, what an amazing time. Yet it was such a horrendous time. My mum grew up in the Great Depression. She got caught stealing oranges and they were all stuck in her bloomers and she couldn't run and got caught. Go figure. She was convict. No, nah, um, <laughs> But in the Great Depression, when all the trouble was on, some of the greatest inventions were made. Because innovation has to happen, had to happen out of incredible. Luke 4, or rather, it said this the great the things that changed in the Great Depression, Otto Rottweiler's invention, 
A bread slicing and wrapping machine made its premiere at, in a Missouri bakery. You know, incredible, you know, when you think about that, here's an invention that went round the world, you know, it's the best thing since sliced bread, really. <laughs> but you think about that, the incredible invention happened in the time of depression and it saved on labour. That's what it was doing. Monopoly was made, the source of every family fight. <laughs> Sticky tape, the Great Depression. Nylon, the Great Depression. The photocopier, 1930s, was invented. Incredible, isn't it? You think about all those things, all the challenge that was on, and these incredible inventions happened because they were facing the challenge rather than walking away from it. Maybe in your life there's been a health crisis, a relationship crisis. It's a time to face that, take an opportunity, find solutions that you didn't know existed before the crisis. Make use of your crises. See, challenging times makes room for innovative solutions. Challenging times make room for God to move. I, I, I don't know about you, but I love the stories of revival. I've studied revival, and um, I love the stories of revival. And the things I've noticed about revival, when God seems to, when the space between heaven and earth seems to get thinner, I've noticed they happen after challenging times or during challenging times. Revival happens when there's a challenge. And I look out the world today and go, wow, there's a few challenging times. There's a great article in The Australian today on the church and the challenging times the church is facing. It's written in the, the Australian newspaper. And it's so interesting, isn't it? The challenging times, but that's when God moves. Why? Because I think we're desperate for God to move. We've come to the end of ourselves. It's not something we can do. We actually need God to do something. We come to that point where we're saying, God, you need to move. Challenging times makes room for God's to move. 2 Corinthians, and this is Paul talking about his life. It says this, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Isn't that interesting? A messenger of Satan to buffet him. And I look at that and think, hey, there's times I think when messengers of Satan buffet us. But this is what it went on to say. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I don't know about you, but I whinge a lot longer than that. More than three times. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Isn't it interesting that God is made perfect through our challenges in our life. That his grace, the unmerited favour of God, the power of God to overcome sin, the grace of God in our life makes a way for us to make a difference. The reality is, however, and I think it's important out of that verse, is the devils and his cronies are around and he's not omnipresent, as we heard Ben preach the other week about omnipresence. The devil's not omnipresent, but he is around. And we need to recognise that and recognise it in our life. The devil comes to try and stop you. The, you know what? The devil doesn't like you. Isn't that an interesting thought? He actually doesn't like And more than that, he actually hates you because you're created in the image of God and you're created to worship God. And he doesn't want that. He actually wants the worship. So he hates you. And therefore you can expect the devil to come and harass you. That's why we need God. That's why we need that scripture that says, my grace is sufficient for you to overcome the challenges that the evil one will bring your way. See, it's so easy, I find, to rely on my own abilities. So easy to rely on my own knowledge. So easy to, to rely on my gifting. Yet one of the things I've found is when God gets involved, better things happen. I love what we're doing as Highlands. I love and I see the, 
the power and the presence of God in things that we do. Like, you know, we bought that block of land at Highfields, 100 acres in Highfields we bought for $3 million or three million and fifty thousand dollars And you think about that, you go, well, that's a lot of money, it is. But the guy that was selling it had an offer at $7 million on it, but it was conditioned. It had to be a God deal. Hey, there's an offer on the table for 7 million bucks. And we offer 3 million. And he goes, add 50,000 to it. Okay. And we got, for 3 million and 50,000, we bought 100 acres in Highfield. Now, sure, his offer was conditional and maybe he needed the money and maybe that was all set up by God and probably was. But an incredible blessing when God gets involved. I think about the place we stand on, a lettuce field. I look at the college now and go, wow, all that infrastructure, all that stuff that was done, it's impossible. Someone said to me the other week, said, Highfield's project's impossible. It is, without God. But so was this place. It was impossible without God. But God moved. And I look at some of the things in our life and some of the things in your lives where you go through and you see the move of God. Yes, it's impossible. That's why there's praise reports on the back wall. There's impossible prayer requests and impossible answers to prayer through praise reports. Because God wants to be involved in our lives. And I think when we come to the end of ourselves is when God can move. One of the things I've found is the more I grow in God, the more I get to know God, the more I realise I need God. I think about when you're a new Christian and you encounter God and you go, wow, this is awesome. Or before you're a Christian, you, I don't need God, I've got everything sorted out. And then you encounter God and you, then you realise God coming into your life and, and the more you grow in Him, the more you realise, man, I need God. It's a bit like what Mark, Twain said about his parents he said this when I was a boy of 14 my father was ignorant was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old men around but when I got to 21 I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years <laughs> it's a bit like that as we get to know God wow there's so much it's so deep because we get to know and understand him and the more we get closer to him, the more we involve in our life, the more the world opens to us, the God-given world opens to us. See, it's easy in life to get stuck. So easy to get stuck in a relationship struggle, when sickness happens, when bad things happen to good people. And it's easy to get stuck. It's easy to get to that point where you can become disappointed. And your disappointment can anchor you where you don't want to be. King David writes in Psalm 42.5, he says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? He is getting that point where he's realising that he's stuck. He's going after a whole pile of things that went on and a few decisions he made that were bad. Well, one particular, two particular ones. If you read his story, he did make a couple of bad decisions, David. And he's saying, why am I so discouraged? Why am I stuck here? It's so easy to let get stuck. It's so easy to see the challenges and get stuck. In one breath, King David's saying, why am I discouraged? In the next breath, he gives a solution. In Psalm 42, uh, verse 5b, he says, I'll put my hope in God and I will praise him. He gives a solution to his discouragement. He gives a solution to his disappointment. And he says, the solution is, I'm going to praise you, God. I'm going to encounter you. I'm gonna, and no matter what you're going through, no matter what challenge you're facing, one of the things that I've found in my life is there's power in praise. But I've found it's really easy to praise him on the mountaintop. It's really easy when things are going great. Oh God, you're so good. But I find it a little bit more challenging when you're on an operating table or you've been given bad news to praise him. But actually, the answer is in praise. Choose worship over worry. Choose worship over worry. 
It really does make a difference. If you start to worship yourself. I think Hebrews puts it so nicely. Hebrews says it this way. He says, Therefore by him let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. See, on a mountaintop, it's not a sacrifice. On a mountaintop, it's, this is great. There's no sacrifice in praising God on the mountaintop. It's not. It's just great life. Thank you, God. It's great. But the sacrifice of praise happens in the challenge. The sacrifice of praise is when everything is going wrong and you say, God, I'm still going to praise you. I can't see an answer, but I'm still going to praise you. The bad news has come my way, but I'm still going to praise you. There's something incredibly powerful about the power of praise. The power of praise attracts others to you. The power of praise, actually people want to be around you. One of the things I've noticed is people don't want to be around misery. As Doug Wood said, no one really liked misery, but everyone was happy about someone that was happy. Because there being something in you that comes out. I love it when you're praising and, and people look at you and they go, what is it about you? Don't you realise what just happened? But that's the opportunity for God to move. The opportunity for God to move is when we're actually going through a struggling time. The Bible says really clearly in Psalm 23, uh, 22 verse 3, praise is a vehicle that God inhabits. Praise is a vehicle that attracts God. And I think when you're in the challenge and you're facing the challenges of life, we're desperate for God. I don't know about you, I am. I'm desperate for that encounter with God. And praise is actually what attracts him. Look at Paulus, Paul and Silas in the jail. Paul and Silas are in this jail. They've been locked up. They've just been whipped. They were just basically... Uh, abused by a whole city because they identified some foreign god and was they, what they were worshipping and making all the money out. So they, the authorities grabbed them and whipped them and then threw them in jail and they started to praise. They started to sing and they started to praise. And then it says this, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The prisoners were listening to them. Notice that the world will look, when you're in trouble, the world will look at you and go, what is it about you? The prisoners, they were listening to them. They were going, what is it about these two? They've just been whipped. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundation of the prisons was shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. It wasn't only Paul and Silas's chains that was loose. Freedom came to the rest of them. Freedom came through praise. Freedom comes to people around you. When they see you encountering God, when they experience the power of God in your life, it's often to set other people free. There's so many testimonies in this place of people that have been praising God through circumstances and other people have been set free. It's so incredibly powerful if you can catch it. You know, I think about, wouldn't it have just been easier for God not to let Paul and Silas be whipped and go to jail? God could do that, couldn't he? The reality is God could have stopped Paul and Silas from going to jail. But he allowed them to go through it, which I think is incredibly tough to see other people set free. To see other people encounter God. See, God's timing is God's timing. And I think we can be so disappointed sometimes where God doesn't turn up when we expect him to turn up. I'm sure Paul and Silas would have much preferred God to turn up before jail. Would have much preferred to turn up before the whipping. But God's timing is God's timing. But the thing that I love about that story is they were praising him. And people were set free. John chapter 11, verse 39. And this is a story about Martha and Lazarus. So if you don't know the story, Lazarus had died. And um, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. And he'd been dead for four days. So Martha and Mary, Lazarus had died. Jesus delayed his coming. 
and at the time Martha's saying, he stinks. If you'd have been here, it said before, Mary said, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. They knew the opportunity, they knew what Jesus could do, and then, but Jesus delayed it because he wanted to show his glory. And so often we miss that, we miss what God is doing through our challenges. And we can be like Mary and Martha and miss it. Disappointment is maintained by meditating on unmet expectations. And I think about that. Think about Mary and Martha. Their expectation is that Jesus would have come and Lazarus would have been okay. And if, if when you read that story, you, you can actually feel the tinge in Mary and Martha's heart. And maybe in your life there's been those medita- meditating on disappointments. Maybe it hasn't gone your way. I promised Moira that I'd be a, me- a millionaire by 30. That was one of my sale lines to, for marriage. And she was disappointed. <laughs> maybe there's been some promises made to you that haven't come to pass. Maybe there's been some challenges that has caused disappointment in your life. But one of the things I've noticed is this. Forgiveness is God's way of resolving those challenges. Forgive yourself. Forgive others. See, it's so easy to meditate on the the things that are wrong. You see it in marriages, don't you? And Pastor, I've sat with many marriages going through challenges. And things that I've always found is they start to meditate on the disappointments rather than the great things. When they were first married, when we were first married, you know, when you're first married, it's, wow, this is so exciting. Well, you don't see any problem. And after you've been there for a while, you notice the socks aren't picked up. You notice the toilet paper's the wrong way around. You start to see the problems. And if you meditate on the problems, you start to see more problems. But it's like that in every relationship, isn't it? The closer you get to people, the more problems you see, if you view the problems. But if you see the good things, the more good things you see. What are the good things that are going on in your relationship? What are the good things that are going on in your life? Meditate on these things. As Paul said, meditate on things that are lovely, things that are pure. Meditate on these things. Forgive those other things. Because forgiveness makes a way to go through life without disappointment. But you say, but they did it again, Ken. They did it again. How many times do you have to forgive them? It's a real challenge, isn't it? Because sometimes you forgive someone and then they do it again. They make all the promises in the world and they do it again. Jesus answered this to Peter and Peter asked that same question. He said, Lord, how often shall I, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And he said up to seven times and he thought he was doing good because seven, the word, the seven is a sign of completeness. So seven was complete. He said, I've completely forgiven them. And Jesus said, no, 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 up to 70 times seven. In other words, infinite. And the problem with that is in Christianity is we can say, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to endure a bad relationship. I'm going to endure abuse. No, no, you can forgive it, but it doesn't necessarily mean you condone the behavior. And that's really important because sometimes I've seen it and I had a, a counsellor lady years ago, a friend of ours actually, she became close friends and uh, her husband was a horrible husband, an alcoholic, drug addict, abuser and the Christians were saying to her, you need to go and forgive him and go back and she would go back and forgive him and he'd make all the promises in the world but then he'd do it again. <laughs> It doesn't mean you have to stay in the relationship. She actually got out of that relationship, divorced him, but remained friends because she were able to forgive him. And they lived a life. He passed away recently and she actually did the funeral because there's something powerful about forgiveness, but you don't actually have to condone bad behavior. I think about the scripture, you overcome by the blood of the lamb, and the word of your testimony. The blood of the lamb's done. Jesus died on the cross. He overcome sin. 
came in power. But then the word of your testimony. And the testimony is a problem, isn't it? Because how do you get a testimony? You go through a test. I really like the money bit, but I don't like the test. I don't think anyone does. I I never liked tests at school because you had to study. Didn't like that. I like information, I love learning, but then you've got to have that tested to see what you actually know. And it's a bit like when you go through life and you go through struggles, you go through disappointment, you go through suffering, there's a test. But how do you go through it? So I think life is a series of problems that need to be solved. Solutions need to be celebrated. And I think we tend to lose the wonder. And I wonder why. I look at the baby today as we dedicate a child. And you watch a child grow up and they start to crawl. And then they start to walk and they start to talk. And I know with our grandson, he was so frustrated that he couldn't express himself until he learnt the words to speak it out. But we celebrate those things as we go through life, we go through the teenage years, we have, get married, and then we have children, we go through that, our life. It's a series of problems because one of the things I've found when we had children, they didn't come with a, a user manual that said, this is how you do this. And one of the other things I've found is every child's different. And they bring challenges, they bring problems to be solved and solutions to be celebrated. And I think life is like that. See, sometimes we need a problem to find a great solution for our life. What solutions do you need to find? It's so easy to see the problems, isn't it? so easy to identify problems but it's so much greater to see solutions that solve the problems when I think about the challenges of life and the problems we face that we can get stuck saying God why why did this happen Why did this happen to me? Why am I on the shelf? Why am I here? Why am I there? Why has gone on? Can I encourage you to not ask why, but ask God, what's next? What's next, God? Because if we stay stuck on the why, sometimes we never get a solution. We never get an answer. But if we change our question from why to what's next, we can step into the good things and the great things of God. So my question to you this morning as I finish, no matter where you are and no matter what you're doing, what is your next step? What is next for you? No matter what age you are, there's a next. No matter what stage of your Christian journey you are, there's a next. What's your next step? Don't get stuck in the problems. Don't get stuck in the suffering. Don't get stuck in the disappointment. Forgive and start to look for your next to take you on the journey. Let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you as we come into this place that we can praise you. There's so many good things that happen. We can praise you in the good times. There's so many challenging things that happen that we can praise you in the challenging times. Father, we don't know why bad things happen to good people. We don't know why Paul and Silas were whipped and then thrown in prison. But we do know why afterwards, because they were released and people were set free. Help us to see that, Father, as we go through the challenges of life. Because life happens. Help us be those people where people look at us and go, what is it about you? And our only answer can be, Jesus changed my life. Okay, just while every eye's closed and every head's bowed, we do this in every service. And if you've been in Highlands for a while, you'll know this. But 
we really are excited for you being in this room. And maybe today, maybe today you've never given your life to Christ. You've come to church. Maybe you've been in church all your life, but you've never actually said yes to Jesus. You've never actually said, Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Maybe you've been going through hell in your life and you need God to set you free. Jesus is the answer. I want to give you that opportunity to know him today. So right across this room right now, if that's you, well, no one's looking around, so you've got privacy. If that's you, would you raise your hand so I can see it, so I can pray with you. So look across this room. Is there anyone in this place today that needs to give their life to you? I see that hand. It's so good. That's awesome. Congratulations. Right across this room. Last time I'm asking this one, I don't want to delay it, but you are so valuable to God. He wants to come into your life. He wants to help you. Last time. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Let's pray together. If you raised your hand, leave you. If you didn't, pray this prayer with me. I love this prayer. It's a small but powerful prayer. Incredibly powerful prayer. It goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I surrender my life to you today, Lord. Have your way. Forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong, my sin. Forgive me, Father. But Father, this morning, I ask you to make yourself so real to me. In Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. And if it did impact you and you did give your life to Christ today, we would love to hear from you and be able to help you on this next stage of your journey. So send us a message on Facebook or Instagram or by the website so that we can connect with you and start the process with you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.